Hello, I'm Patricia Grubel from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I'm going to give you an overview of what is to come in the tutorial today. We will explore software development processes that will aid your team during development and aid them in ensuring sustainability of their scientific software. The fundamental message we would like you to take away is that science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. Every scientist should be concerned with the quality of the software they are developing and using so that their results will be credible. This is becoming increasingly challenging as science and systems are developing and that results in a positive feedback loop. That's a good thing, but it presents a wide variety of challenges. We've been able to produce more complex algorithms run more sophisticated simulations and analysis due to better computational platforms and higher fidelity models, thus increasing scientific knowledge. But this continues to drive the desire to have more capable hardware and even more complex algorithms. This produces a need for teams with a variety of expertise to handle the parts of a large, complex simulation code. So a separation of concerns for both the team and the software is the way to think about working on these codes. You need a team with a diverse background of experience and expertise. You may need a software engineering process comprised of rules that will help them work together to produce code that is consistent and interoperable. Also, as the hardware platforms increase in computational capacity, the heterogeneity has increased, and this requires teams to deal with challenges in software development and portability to new systems. And that also makes sustainability of the software challenging. So codes need to be able to pass from one generation of hardware to the next. For this cycle to continue to be successful, there needs to be an investment in a flexible design and a robust software engineering process. There are many challenges to developing scientific applications today, both technical and sociological. The models, and the software are complex and almost all the parts are under research. As knowledge of the problem changes, requirements change so that these can be very fluid throughout the life cycle. Then almost all computational software deals with floating point representation, and that becomes a big concern in verifying the software. We are modeling the real world, and the real world is messy, so the software is also messy. And I already discussed the challenges of the increasing architectural diversity of the platforms. Then there are also sociological challenges. There are competing priorities and incentives. Often software development is not recognized like science publications tend to be. Sponsors are often more interested in publications, and in many cases, to further career paths, such as getting promotions or tenure, requires publications while the efforts on software development may not be recognized. One thing the Ideas Project is hoping to do is to help produce a culture change in the wider community and among sponsors to improve recognition of the importance of the software so there can be a balance of development and maintenance of software with the research. And of course, there are limited resources so that you need to prioritize what you are going to do. I talked about the need for a variety of experience on scientific software development teams. This can cause communication challenges with things like having a common vocabulary for the team when discussing processes and software solutions. There are many high consequence scientific failures that have been caused by software. For example, in the 1980s, there was a computer-controlled radiation therapy system, the Therac-25, which had poor software design development and testing practices that allowed flaws that caused substantial radiation overdoses in at least six cases. Some of those were fatal. And then there was the loss of the Mars Climate Orbiter in 1999. Incorrect trajectory adjustments caused the loss of the orbiter just as it was about to enter the Mars orbit. This was caused because the two different software components had a discrepancy between them and the units. One of those components did not follow specifications. And there was inadequate testing at the interface. Even though 
there had been concerns raised earlier, they were not properly documented, and those concerns were ignored. These are just two of many examples I'm sure you have heard of others. There have been other impacts on scientific productivity. For example, in 2005, the Flash Astrophysics team was given the opportunity to have a long dedicated run on the largest machine in the world at the time, the Blue Jane L. They were given very short notice uh, to prepare for this run, so they did a quick and dirty development of the particle tracking capability and ended up with errors in tracking the particles. That This was a result of duplicate tags from Roundoff, a uh, floating point error as it is that we discussed earlier. After the run was made, they had to develop post-processing tools to uh, correct the mistakes. This took six months, and um, even though they had a very robust software process in place, the time constraints made it difficult to apply the entire process. This can often happen when there are other pressures in your project, like paper deadlines, uh, your sponsors want results immediately, or like in this case, a unique window to use a resource. Sometimes this leads to incurring what is termed technical debt. What is technical debt? Technical debt is the implied cost of additional rework caused by choosing an easy or limited solution now instead of using a better approach that would take longer. Like monetary debt, the more you accumulate, the harder it is to pay off technical debt. This may cause increases in the cost of maintenance. Sometimes parts of the software become unusable. And the software produces questionable results because it may not have been adequately verified. There may be things like insufficient documentation causing extra time and effort when onboarding new developers. So the aim is to use processes that reduce technical debt resulting in an increase of software productivity with the desired result of increasing science productivity. The facilities being used for scientific research provide valuable resources. First of all, most supercomputers today cost over $100 million. And then there are millions of dollars spent on operating and, and maintaining them manually. And significant allocations on these large supercomputers can be worth millions. Most likely you're getting access to these systems because you are producing scientific results and publishing those results in the open. And even if you're not directly paying the cost that you would pay if it was a commercial enterprise, there are other costs involved, such as time and effort writing insight or other type proposals. So sponsors are concerned that you are using the resources to produce quality science or in other words, that you are a good steward of those valuable resources. You should also be concerned that you are getting the most science that you can out of the allocations you have been given. And of course, it is to your own benefit to get the most out of these valuable resources. And then you will have positive scientific productivity. Ultimately, we want good scientific processes. But a good scientific process requires good software practices, and good software practices increase scientific productivity. At the same time, good software practices increase software sustainability. Many scientific software packages have been around for quite a while, even decades. They have evolved with increase in scientific knowledge and with the capability of hardware platforms. So you need to think about the long-term lifetime of your software so that you structure the software to make it maintainable and sustainable over a long time. This can prevent reinventions and thus increase scientific productivity. So what are good software practices? Well, unfortunately, there are no universally agreed fixed set of best practices for scientific software. And that's partially because there are different makeups of the team and the use of the software. So we may have, you may have software that's only used for a one-time task or some other personal purpose. 
Or maybe you have a small team that is just using the software to publish papers, or a small number of users, or uh, you may have a very large complex software with many users, maybe uh, thousands of users, or your software uh, might be a dependency for many other software systems. So let's look at some recommendations from different perspectives in the community. The, our first example is a paper written by Greg Wilson and others in 2014 called Best Practices for Scientific Computing. I'm going to go through some of the details that are here, but feel free to come back and go over these details if you want to get to more uh, information. You can also look at the paper. Um, first of all, write programs for people, not computers. Use code style and formatting and be consistent with them. Let the computer do the work. You can take repeated tasks and put them in scripts and then save those for using again. Also, you can use a build to tool that automates workflows. Uh, make your changes incremental. Uh, putting in large merge requests or pull requests can sometimes make them very um, hard to understand. So if you work in small steps and then you can get frequent free feedback so that if there is a problem you get a, a quick course correction. And everything that you created manually you should put in version control, including some of the scripts for um, doing repeated tasks. Don't repeat yourselves. Use modularization for your code so that you don't aren't copying and pasting and use re, uh, code that's been written before use reuse it instead of rewriting it and then you can plan for mistakes add assertions to make sure that programs fail when they should uh, turn bugs that you fix into test cases and then you can increase your testing Additional points from best practices for scientific computing include things like optimizing the software after you have ensured that it works correctly. Um, maybe you have uh, want to include special optimizations for your compiler, so check the software is working and giving you correct results, and then apply the optimization. Also, it's important that you um, have good documentation that the documentation is embedded with the software, uh, that you document interfaces and the reasons for an implementation, not just the implementation. And, um, the, and these are very important points, so um, look into them. Also, for collaboration, we'll get into this more with the Git Workflows section of the tutorial. Um, use code reviews. This puts more eyes on the code gives more understanding among the team, and catches mistakes, honestly. Uh, also use prior programming, uh, especially when you're bringing someone new up to speed. Also, if there's a particularly tricky problem, or if somebody um, just needs to have a better understanding of another part of the code or even implementations, uh, may make them uh, a better programmer whether they're old or new <laughs> to the project. Uh, use an issue tracking tool. So some teams might uh, have problems with um, doing, uh, making all the best practices. So this team, this group of people, um, most of them are the same people, wrote another paper called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing. And um, I'm going to skip through most of these details, but feel free to come back to them. They have points on data management and software. Data management is becoming very important because of uh, being able to reproduce results. Um, they have points on software and then how to write manuscripts. This Good Enough Practices paper also has points on collaboration, project organization, and keeping track of changes. The Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative has the Best Practices Badging Program. 
It's not specifically intended for scientific software, but has a lot of value for uh, the scientific software projects. There are three levels of badging. There's passing, silver, and gold. Uh, these are a combination of must and should criteria. This is a simplified list, but there is a very extensive set of criteria with links that justify why these practices are important. And you can look through them and see what you can adapt to your circumstances. They have requirements in change control and bug reporting, uh, quality, coding standards, and security. Uh, security is very important, especially when you consider workflows in uh, these com with these complex uh, software systems and uh, bringing in maybe outside data and also uh, with uh, known vulnerabilities uh, and also when you have codes that are coupled together with maybe some outside type uh, sources and also they have code analysis uh, information so um, look into these criteria see what might help you um, you can uh, there are more specific criterias on the site see what you can adapt to your purposes the best practices are a good example of software engineering advices in the wild um, they are not they don't always consider the special nature of scientific software but that doesn't mean that we should ignore these uh, types of software engineering practices there are many useful concepts and uh, some tools that we can adopt. Some of these approaches might need to be adapted to work for scientific workflows. Uh, talk to your colleagues. Maybe some of them have already addressed the same issues that you are facing, and uh, you might find multiple ways to um, take care of the challenges that uh, are affecting your uh, processes. In the end, some of the approaches might not work well, uh, but don't be afraid to experiment with adaptations and don't spend time on those that don't work for you. Uh, consider using the PSIP process. It's from the Ideas program, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. So the question is that you might ask yourself is, how much time should I spend on software engineering? You may be thinking, we cannot adopt all the pra best practices, and you are probably right. You need to balance when and where you should spend your time. So your project should include just enough software engineering so that you can meet your short-term and your longer-term scientific goals effectively. We recommend that you improve your software process in a continuous and incremental fashion. So uh, looking at this chart, you may have some process that uh, has a, a continuous cost, but if you were to invest a little bit of effort and cost in an upfront change, you could flatten that curve so that uh, you are actually change, um, saving uh, time and costs in the long run. So one of the things you can do is to use the productivity and sustainability improvement planning process. And there's more, uh, that's the PSIP site um, here that I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, one of the things to start with would be that you want to identify your team's pain points, and you can do that by uh, using the Help your, Rate Your Project Assessment tool. Get all your team members to take this assessment. It doesn't take very long, and there are uh, suggestions uh, for improvement. And you can decide together on something that you could improve in the process, set a goal for that, you want to target processes and behaviors, not tasks, but pick something that you could address in a few months and that you know would give you a benefit. Agree on a plan together and uh, then write down um, some markers of progress towards your goal. And this uh, will become a progress tracking card. And there are examples in the catalog that you can look at to get some idea of things that that uh, may be applicable to uh, your project. Uh, once you've come up with your progress tracking card, work the plan, um, track your progress in it, uh, check off the milestones as you complete them, 
and when you are done, have a celebration. Then you can pick another new pain point to address. Also, we have um, resources at the Better Scientific Software site that for improving your software processes. And if you find other useful resources that aren't on the site, continue, uh, consider contributing them. It's really quite quick and easy. Although there are many useful sources that can help improve your development process, software engineering practices in the wild don't always address scientific software. So we are going to address or focus on those areas and we will be covering such topics as project management, collaboration, uh, during software development, design, testing strategies, and uh, refactoring of large complex software systems. And we'll also get into continuous integration and reproducibility. So the agenda is available also on our tutorial web page. Uh, visit the site and click on the link for the SC21 tutorial. It should remain there, even it will remain there even after um, uh, supercomputing is over. And of course we'll get into Git workflows next, then we'll go through agile methodologies, we'll look at design, then we'll take a break, and we'll do some more on agile methodologies. Uh, then we'll talk about reproducibility, and then we'll have some time for uh, hands-on activities and uh, or discussions, whichever uh, you would like to join in on. We'll take our lunch. After lunch, we'll get into testing uh, and continue with continuous integration testing and then uh, look at complex software and how that should be tested. We'll go over refactoring and then we'll have another break. After the break, we'll have a summary and then we will break out into hands-on activities and or discussions. I believe there will be breakout rooms for those. And uh, don't forget to look at the site for the agenda slides and uh, uh, other information, the hands-on material. You can review some of the hands-on material uh, during the breaks.